Hello and uh, welcome everybody to the latest episode of Cook and Liberty, a show in which I get to cook as the title of the show says and friends from the Liberty Movement uh, that join me will talk about liberty, culture, all, all, everything more or less depends on how the conversation goes. Well, well today with me I have Jorge Jarisati who is a um, director at um, uh, Alumni for Liberty and Jan Moschowski who is the uh, manager, program, programs manager at student, uh, European Students for Liberty and emphasis on European. Uh, welcome! Thanks and thanks for, for inviting us. Yeah, the pleasure is far, uh, far, far bigger on, on my side but anyhow uh, for, for those of you that sort of uh, have been watching this uh, before we start the talking part of the show I get to sort of tell you what I'm gonna cook and uh, my, my guests earlier asked me what am I cooking how do I call this dish and I don't know so because beans and bacon are Technically, the main parts of the dish, I'm gonna call it Simon's beans, beans with bacon. So that's why I'm gonna cook uh, first and foremost. And afterwards, for some sweets, we're gonna have bananas uh, with um, some biscuits and some honey, which is surprising to me, quite a nice dish. I did not expect the first time I made that. So uh, without further ado, while I, I get start cooking, uh, I wanna start the show with, of course, our Venezuelan friend who might be interesting to a lot of Europeans just because he's a Venezuelan, but at the same time, as much as little as Europeans care about anything else in Europe, he might, might be uh, less interesting in the pro... So it's, I'm gonna roll the dice, so I'm gonna go with the inter inter interesting part and with the hard question. So we, we know that uh, Venezuela was relatively rich country, until uh, uh, until Chavez came, so what happened? What really happened? Uh, and do, I don't want the communism answer. I, I want more deeper answer. What happened? And how did you sort of fucked it up? So if you want the you want the really deep answer, then is that before Chavez came to power, not everything was perfect. And in the rest of Latin America, yes, we were richer. Yes, we were a democracy. But a big part of the population really felt that they were not understood by the political elite. That they, were, they felt uh, outside the system. They felt that their voices were not being heard. And sadly, Chavez took that sentiment and built a political, built his political capital around that. Uh, so that was the way Chavez rose to power. Uh, at the time, we had a ton of uh, poverty. We have a ton of uh, inequality. Not, not, not more than what we have now, but we did actually had it. And then when Chavez rose to power, then his policies actually made everything worse. And that's why we have a humanitarian crisis right now, um, because of the exactly communist uh, answer that you didn't want me to give you. <laughs> of course. But actually, that's the reason that they implemented a series of uh, socialist economic policies that destroyed all market incentives, market mechanisms, the rule of law, democracy. And that's why we are living a humanitarian crisis right now. Uh, so why Europeans should care about Venezuela? They should care because if these policies are implemented in other places, then the same results will happen. So what we need to do is to avoid that. Do you call him Chavez or Chavez? Well, Chavez is the way, well, Hugo Chavez is the way we're pronouncing it in, in Spanish. G gotta ask, gotta ask, you know, Again, we, we're Europeans, it's so, it's so hard, you know. Yeah, you're Eastern European, so yeah. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm from Macedonia, it's not East, but okay. Uh, uh, my, 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 my accent sort of gives that vibe I understand, but I'm holding the knife now, so exactly. I, I wouldn't say yeah, Eastern yeah. Europeans. Nobody, he is from Eastern Europe, right? <laughs> nobody, from East, nobody from Eastern Europe likes to be called Eastern Europe, so we call exactly. ourselves Central Europe, they call themselves the Balkans. Exactly, yeah. So, they, exactly. so Eastern Europe is a ghost region. Right? <laughs> everybody, sort of, everybody sort of knows where it is, except the people from there. The, who actually <laughs> the, the fun part, uh, since you mentioned, you know, um, Eastern Europe, Vienna basically is far Eastern, uh, closer, let's say, to, to the Eastern Bloc than, than uh, Warsaw, which, uh, sorry, than um, Prague, which is basically, yeah. you know, the, the Czech capital. The thing is, because you were commies after 45 and the Viennese were not, so Vienna and Austria are still, you know, Western Europe and Czech Republic is still Eastern Europe. But like this sort of brings me brings me to, to the, my next question. Uh, one of the better transitions that happened dur during the sorry post uh, post Berlin Wall uh, and post the break of USSR was Czech Republic. So what was the thing that you as a nation did correctly? Yeah. So first thing was that the people who actually ran the economic transition were. Uh, big fans of Milton Friedman especially and the Chicago School and also of Hayek so they had the they knew where they wanted to go 
uh, with the economy that they that they sort of inherited after the previous regime. And uh, to plug in SFL, we actually hosted one of the authors of the transition at the anniversary conference for the 30 year after the revolution two years ago. What, what's it's, his it's name? Four years ago. It was Dusan Triska. It's longer ago than it seems. It's four years ago. Uh, it was before the before the pandemic, but never mind. Uh, Shameless plug on the side of Jan Marshovsky. Yes, and I will keep doing that, so be ready. And uh, the thing that they did was pretty much uh, they gave all the state companies away uh, to the Czech citizens. So if you were a Czech citizen, you could get a coupon book uh, for a very cheap price. Uh, and on the coupon book, there were a number of coupons that you could use to buy uh, company bonds or like uh, stock. And uh, people did that. Uh, it had advantages and disadvantages. So the idea of not selling it was first of all, people after communism didn't have the money to actually buy the companies at market value. Secondly, you didn't know the company's market value after 40 years of communism. Yeah, yeah. There were and no, no markets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, the idea was that if you sell the companies, then the state gets money, and you didn't, as a as a pro, as a liberal at the time, you didn't really want the state to have money instead of companies. Like that wouldn't change much. So, and also, foreigners would own all the companies, and the idea was to sort of have uh, Czech people and, and Slovak people at the time uh, become owners of the companies. And so they did that. It was quite successful. There are, of course, disadvantages, such as people who were in the communist leadership in the past. Uh, they were the ones with the knowledge of how the companies work mm. and they were the ones who could navigate the system. And we decided uh, not to persecute anybody uh, who was uh, responsible for the regime or representative for the regime. So many of the companies actually transitioned to, to former communists and uh, communist leaders and communist helpers, uh, such as our previous prime minister who got very rich of the privatization as well. But, uh, so he was one of them. But that was the risk that was taken and it seems to have worked out quite well. The, the guy that suicided in, in Prague in 68, right? He, uh, Jan Palak. Jan Palak. It's, it's foreign name and always doesn't ring a bell, you know, to pronounce it. Is he still celebrated, you know, yes. properly celebrated from, in, from our perspective, uh, our point of view, let's say? Yes. So there, uh, uh, on the anniversary, there is always some uh, commemoration, and on the square where it happened, you can see the the, bird, uh, yeah. the, the charred cross. I have a picture over there. Yes. It's a, spe it's a special feeling you get when you uh, go at that place. I don't know. So to give it context, and so Czech Republic uh, was part of the communist bloc, and but in the 60s, uh, while the destalinization was happening everywhere in the Eastern Bloc. Uh, Czech Republic was one of the more liberal, or Czechoslovakia at the time. Czechoslovakia, my friend. Was, uh, was <laughs> one of the more liberal countries and the Soviets didn't like that. So they were afraid that we would go the Yugoslavian way and sort of split away from, from them. Not much better, but... <laughs> but still better. And so they, uh, uh, they actually have the, the Warsaw Pact armies invade the country yeah. and, and kidnap the political... The, Kidnap the communist political leadership. There was like, it was a period of liberalization, but it was still communism. Yep. But and they kidnapped the communist leadership, and in response to, uh, to the invasion of the Soviets, then it wasn't actually just Jan Palak. It was more people. The the living torches who in protest burned themselves in public places. I know only one other name, but again, cannot pronounce him. But everybody knows of Jan Palak, and it is a special special. I would say, picture from history similar to the Tiananmen Square, the tank man. Right. Jan Palak for me is that kind of thing. O on the other hand, the Venezuelans uh, protesting after, this was after Chavez, if I'm not mistaken, Chavez, pardon. <laughs> See, I learn slowly, but I learn. It's one of those uh, similar to the first McDonald's in Russia, uh, in Moscow. I mean, to me, those are very special events. Do you have some, some sort of special events like that in, in Venezuela? Well, we do, in fact, not as, fa as famous as, as those cases, but you know that in every political transition and every political movement, the images and the symbolism are so important because those are the moments that really stick into the mind of the people. So, for example, in Venezuela, we have a famous uh, political prisoner that the moment that he was put into jail, 
It's like a very famous moment, a very famous picture. There is also a moment in which there was a guy who used to play the violin in the protest. And he was playing the violin in the middle of the protest and you saw the military behind, you saw the repression behind. And I think it was the most vivid example of how somebody wants to express themselves mm. and you have then the regime trying to repress them. Uh, but yeah, we have a few of those moments, not as powerful as, for example, Tiananmen Square, yep. which is very powerful. And I really do believe that that's the way you build change. Uh, the, the, you get into the people's mind, and that's the way you get into the people's attention, yes. See, now with the war in Ukraine happening, uh, the Westerners, but uh, non-European Westerners have sort of a misconception about it. Uh, Jan, uh, before we sort of started this, uh, mentioned a story of a professor that he knows coming from America to Czech Republic to give a lecture and all of a sudden his uh, family was like, no, stop, war is happening, you know, over there because they think of uh, similar to how we think of the US as a one, one nation, basically they have 50 states and how similar to how we don't know where Michigan is, they have no idea where Czech Republic is. So, but like coming from that point, what would you say that the big misconception from Americans, let's say, first and foremost, start regarding maybe Europe in principle, maybe Central Europe, but more, most importantly about the war in Ukraine and the, uh, Russia, uh, con uh, Russia's influence in, the, in Central to Western Europe? So if you are talking about specifically American misconception, I would say that and I have very limited knowledge of it, but I would say Americans are still <laughs> sort of culturally traumatized by Vietnam and more recently Afghanistan. And they tend to think, especially the people who mm. oppose US involvement in Ukraine or assistance to Ukraine, they tend to think that these situations are the same. Mm -hmm. So they think that any, any US involvement or assistance abroad is the same as Vietnam or Afghanistan. And that's why I think they are opposed to it. But the situation is something. Like Would you say that it's different? No, let, let me add something here. It's no, of course. The, the Americans, uh, some part of the Americans, they see this issue as an issue that is exclusively related to them. There is an ethnocentrism yep. in, the, in that way. There is something that they believe that everything that is going around the world is related to them directly. And many Americans believe that. Many Americans believe that the war in Ukraine is because of something that they did in regards to foreign policy and not in relation to uh, something that is going on uh, in Ukraine. That's what I have seen, really, when I talk mm -hmm. to Americans. Mm -hmm. So we did talk a bit about the what's happening in Ukraine, but uh, when you think of 2016 and the presidential elections, all of a sudden there was this Russian collusion, this or that. And I know that professionally you have talked uh, a lot about uh, this in a sense that um, from a different perspective that there is a big coordination happening between the authoritarian regimes. And for someone like me, again, coming from Europe, it's, I mean, I can understand in 60s Cubans and, uh, and the Soviets cooperating, but now to think of Venezuelans, uh, Iranians and Russians and Chinese together, it's a bit hard. So can you sort of explain the situation here? But before you do uh, uh, a short thing, I'll or we already cooked the, the bacon. So in that, in that um, oil, we're going to continue cooking um, um, the onion. I'm going to add garlic. After that, when they get golden brown, I'm going to add the, the tomatoes. And after that, we give, uh, we put some, some bean stock uh, and then we put the beans and everything is sort of connected, but we have to make some sauce with, with, uh, with tomatoes and it's easy. All you do is just get ripe tomatoes, nice. place them in and then you have it. But back to your, your thoughts. Uh, I mean, I, I must say that I'm, I'm very, I'm getting hungry. So <laughs> now it's getting, it's getting better. So yeah, you, you, you made a, you're talking about the lecture I gave at Harvard two months ago about the, the issue. Was like, what are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I mean, I, I, I have seen on, on your social ne media networks that you have given that, get that speech. So I don't necessarily know where, etc. But, uh, and, but I know that it was uh, a speech on this topic. So okay, and it's okay. really interesting. So you're talking about this relationship. Yeah, yeah, the, the relationship between the, the authoritarian governments. Let's I mean, say. something that okay, okay. Now, now I get it. Basically, what this something the international community was not aware. Of is that the level of cooperation, synergy, that exists between these different authoritarian regimes. 
between Russia, Iran, Syria, Venezuela, and even places like Turkey and Belarus. They don't have anything in common ideologically, because what can they have in common? Uh, an Ayatollah in Iran, a conservative in Russia, a socialist in Venezuela. They don't have anything in common. The only thing they have in common is that they have a common enemy, and they have a common interest, which is to maintain power. So they have developed these networks of cooperation that allows them to increase their grip on power domestically and increase their leverage, their international leverage. So they do that through military cooperation. They do that through mechanisms to avoid US sanctions, mechanisms to avoid diplomatic pressures. And they are being doing, they're being very efficient on, on ways to do that. They exchange information on treatment of political prisoners and that's something that I think the international community needs to pay more attention. And people like us, uh, Students for Liberty, we are in over 100 countries. So if they are increasing their synergy, uh, we who believe in freedom have to do the same. Would you say that what was called the free world uh, during the Cold War is do isn't doing the same thing, cooperating, and not always in so peaceful and freedom-loving uh, aspects and first thing that always comes to mind are the uh, American and NATO in interventions, probably in Libya, maybe in Syria, as, as someone might say, uh, as, as bad or worse were the Ruskies in, in Syria, were NATO any better? I wouldn't know, again, no, not an expert here, just asking. Right. Well, it's, it's very different. For example, the intervention in, in Libya was approved by the UN, so there was some level of legality there. Uh, however, uh, in hindsight, it was a mistake. Everything that the U.S. has done in Iraq, everything the U.S. has done in, in Vietnam, has been mistakes. Uh, what the free world really means is people who believe in the same ideas. Uh, so that the, the way I think the international alliance should be built is not on interest, but on ideas. That's why relationships with countries like uh, Saudi Arabia are shaky, uh, because they also have a repression to their people. So that's, that's the way it is. I'm not saying that the West is perfect, that, because it is not, uh, but it's the West way better alternative. Uh, what we should do is that we should lobby for, because our governments are better, more democratic, freer. Uh, but in the other countries, in Iran, in Venezuela, nobody can lobby. Nobody can say anything. Uh, so we need to improve, yes, and we need to support what is closest to what we believe. What would you say, uh, Jan, uh, this is directed to, uh, coming from, you know, a student's organization, what would you say that uh, is the position on, on these values from the Western world? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, I would say that, I mean, the position on the value is easy. Like, we are, of course, in alignment with, with, uh, with the idea of, of both economic and social freedoms and I think part of it is what you mentioned uh, Jorge is also uh, providing support for people in the countries uh, as well as the countries themselves and I think one aspect of it uh, that both ideological and practical is not being afraid of unilateral steps uh, so uh, not being afraid of you know providing more access to uh, to people one way uh, because it's easy, I think, to succumb to the enemy mindset that you that you mentioned, right. and being against uh, uh, everybody from the undemocratic countries and uh, or the undemocratic countries as a bloc. But I think that is in a way becoming them, and, and we can be really afraid to you know, <laughs> let let people in who want to leave the countries and and provide you know assistance when when possible. See, I will say sort of this is the position of uh, a lot of Macedonians who are not um, pro-Russia, but they're so anti-American, uh, especially because of the war that happened in Yugoslavia and the bombardment that followed with NATO uh, in 1990 in Serbia. And a lot of people are not pro-Russia, but they are more anti-US. And when you ask them on the street, they will say that they are against Ukraine, but only because it sort of represents everything American in foreign policy. Do you have sort of similar uh, thing happening in Czech Republic as well? Yeah, uh, we do. Uh, just uh, this week, last week, we had a large demonstration in Prague. It was uh, 
several thousand people uh, demonstrating against the government and against the support to Ukraine. And I think this is something, I, I really like that you brought it up, because I think that's something that unites not only the regimes, but authoritarians of all kinds, mm -hmm. is, the, is the need for the common enemy. I think it's part of what motivated even the invasion to Ukraine, was to, you know, <coughs> get domestic political power from unifying people around the, around the, around the enemy, which was supposed to be Ukraine. Uh, and I think, I think that just generally motivates a lot of these pushes. So uh, unifying people against enemies is just easier, and that's why the authoritarian regimes or people who try to push for authoritarian regimes uh, mm -hmm. in freer countries uh, leverage a lot. Yes. And I mean, and in relation, related to your question before, is that the West has also made so many mistakes in the past that it's very easy to trigger uh, those things among the population. In Latin America, we have a very difficult relationship with the U.S. because of how many dictators have been yep. supported by the U.S. Um, in Argentina, in Chile, in Paraguay, etc. I mean, the intervention in Nicaragua in the 80s, if I'm not right, with the... Virtually in every Latin American country. And even okay. now, you have the Biden administration negotiating with the Maduro regime. Just a few years later, uh, to the fact, to, to, to the other way, that the U.S. was supporting Venezuela because of their freedoms and democracy and all that, and now they're negotiating with the regime. So that contradiction is really a problem in the West because it creates a lot of, uh, you know, difficult relationships. How do, how do the IMF austerity programs and policies fit into that? So is that viewed as the Americans or is yeah. that... Okay. Yeah, 100%. Like the Washington Consensus, which was the... Yeah. It is called Washington yeah, yeah, Consensus yeah. for yeah. a reason, you know? It's, it's seen as the, as the American way to do development. It's seen as an institution that represents the values or the interests of the Americans. And that's a, that's a problem. And yeah, the IMF, the World Bank, all these multilateral organizations are seen that way by a big chunk uh, of the population. Mm. Would you say that with a reason? How, how would you change, let's say, not, not a, mm, the Washington consensus or let's say the Western approach to not necessarily development in Africa, you know, and, uh, you know, mm, I'm not asking uh, yes. make a concert with Bono about uh, Africa, but uh, more political, you know, how would you interfere with with change in the world, coming from a position of power of the West? I mean, the problem with the Washington Consensus are, are all these development models, is that what they try to do is that they empower experts from foreign countries to do changes in a top-down manner. Yep. And what happens is that people do not feel represented, people do not feel far part of the, of the solution, and you also have this, in, this interest in place. Uh, so, for example, the process of privatization in Latin America was in a very corrupt manner. Uh, the, the process of opening of foreign markets, a similar deal. What we believe and what the data shows is that the way of doing development is doing it from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. like you need to give economic rights and economic freedom to the people, to the communities. Uh, development is not a matter of privatizing a nationalized company and giving it to another rich guy or giving it to a foreign company. Like development is about creating a set of norms and institutions and policies that empowers people. And another problem with the Washington Consensus was the idea that you can do everything in four years. The idea that you can liberalize all aspects of the economy without any kind of prioritization or without any kind of sequencing or, or without taking into consideration the political capital, the financial capital. So then you have countries like Argentina who basically ex exploded economically yep. and then what is the problem the problem is that when you have conservative or more liberal classical liberal governments in place and they fail at their policies then we don't have a second shot then the socialists then come to power because people are upset and then they will never leave power uh, so if you have one shot we need to be good at it see i know that the developing economies to this day uh, don't have a proper answer on how to do development because yes always institutions this or that but how do we actually make the development and the more honest you will find the economies the the, the more humility they will have they the more uh, times you will hear the answer of I don't know and no, because I, look and, and I agree in some sense with you in the sense that people who are not economists actually tend to give easier answers 
what is the thing? We all know which institutions create growth. Mm. We know that property rights, free trade, rule of law. That's not the problem. The problem is how you implement those institutions. How you turn ideas and principles into operational policies. We all know that we need property rights. How do you really enforce them? Like, how do you really enforce them on the courts and with the police? Like, those type of details, that's the difficult part. The diagnosis and the ideas, we are very clear. If we are in students for liberty, it's because we believe in free markets, free trade, property rights, empowering people, economic freedoms. What is the, the challenge? Is to turn that into really policies. Um, because then you have political questions, you have political challenges, and you have operational capability challenges of the states as well. See, I was gonna... You did mention uh, Students for Liberty, technically what we, uh, I mean, what, not the reason, but what sort of helped us, uh, helped us get here is uh, basically the flag flagship event that uh, Students for Liberty do, at least the European one, uh, so it's like Liberty Council, that's why we are here, so Ian being uh, uh, one of the main organizers of the event, can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, the event and what's it about? That was a smooth segue from dictators to very good. Uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. <laughs> it, it was not planned, though. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So Libericon is a conference that we do. The main goal is sort of not only to bring together your students and to and to and the speakers and to hear some interesting ideas, but also to connect the community. We do it every year, and the conference travels. It's not in a, in the same place every year. Uh, last year we were in Prague, that was the first one after the pandemic, and now we are here in Lisbon, uh, which is also strategic in a sense because uh, of, the, of the growing team of students we have here in Portugal. Uh, so the idea is also to give the local team sort of a boost uh, in their activities and uh, the local liberal community, which is, which is not the biggest one in Europe, but growing. And yeah, we have an interesting weekend ahead of us. We have 72 speakers, if I am right. Uh, there's been some last minute changes, but I think we have 72 speakers. 75. <laughs> <laughs> you might know something I don't know. But uh, we have people registered from the last time I checked during the weekend, it was 57 countries. Nice. Uh, 700 so, people. Average. Yeah, we are expecting around 700 people, so it will be huge and we are looking forward to it. Nice. We will discuss topics ranging from economic freedom, trade, development as well. We have a panel on development, yes. uh, Bitcoin, uh, human rights. <laughs> Thank and you. we have our students speaking on stage as well, which I'm very excited about. We didn't have the space to do it last year, and we are bringing student dogs back, and I'm looking forward to hear what our students have to say. But you like the one in Prague the best, right? Oh. <laughs> of course, but that was, uh, was the last one. Like, this is this year's really and you know it's always getting better. We are improving. Oh, it was last year that the conference sort of. Uh, no, no, not sucked. It, it, oh, come the, on. No, 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 I, no, no. Right here. The weather sucked, and yeah. I, 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 that's what I'm saying. The conference did not suck, but the weather sucked, and I remember that, and it put a big dump on the yeah, conference. On, on Sunday, on Sunday, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean. But we managed to. We've, yeah, that was quite surprising we, and nice. Time. We put up the tents outside so that people can also be outside, and then eventually the weather got better. People show up, so it was fun. And Prague is amazing. I really like Prague. So. <laughs> I mean, I still want to go to the Carl of Most, of course, but that's because of my love for heavy metal, because Sabaton has a song called 1688 uh, about the, the, the great, um, the great Swed Swedish Empire's mm -hmm. last stop before the end of the war, you know, yeah. after defenestration. So, <laughs> you know, different, diff different approaches. Um, so. You, you, mentioned, you mentioned so many students uh, coming and technically being a libertarian organization, a student's organization. Mm -hmm. So can you sort of tell us a bit more about what SFL sort of represents, what it offers to students, but at the same time, um, uh, from, from uh, coming back to the earlier questions, uh, what, not what necessarily SFL represents, but uh, what's the stand of, of, of SFL on the war in Ukraine happening? Okay, so that's all. Long question. Uh, so, SFL I think means different things to different people, but 
for us, our mission has always been to uh, empower the students themselves to go and do stuff. So LibertyCon is sort of one of the only things that we do directly for our for the for the public audience. Uh, but most of it uh, anywhere else in the local countries that's done by the students. So SFL is there to give them the tools and the knowledge and to connect, help them with the connections and, and the resources. And then the students are the ones who do the events, they write the articles, and they speak about very different aspects of liberty. Because I think that's also a very important element of SFL is that we are a big time organization and different countries and I would guess different regions because I have sort of knowledge mostly of Europe only, uh, focus on what's important there. So our team here in Portugal is much more focused on economic freedoms, and because like, they were the first country to famously decriminalize most, yeah. of, most of drugs. So like, their social freedoms are quite good. So they are focused on, our team here is focused on economic freedoms. Yeah. Our other teams are focused on different issues. So I would say that and I want to do it at some point. I want to do like uh, how there is the eight values quiz. Uh, mm. I want to like do do it with the students and do like averages by countries. I think we would. I think it would prove my my what 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 I expect uh, because I have different. I have, I have the idea that different countries have live different ways within liberalism, of course. So that's something I would really like to see. Now look, and, they, they are very different. Like um, in my experience, uh, again, I'm from Venezuela, yes. but I went to, I studied in the US and I live in Europe, and you see how every region is completely different in the way they approach their yes. priorities. Of course. It's, it's about the priorities, it's also about different teams do different things. Some of them focus more on events, in other places we right. have more active activists because that's what's needed in the country, right? And that's what works. So. In some places we have the comfort to sit in the classroom and do educational projects. Yes. In some places people just go to the street because that's what's needed. And coming back to your original question about Ukraine, uh, uh, we are of course very much in uh, support of Ukraine. Uh, our students have been providing accommodation and resources to Ukrainians from day one. Uh, they have been uh, shipping resources to Ukraine, helping people get the other direction, uh, finding them employment or places to stay here. So I think this ends of SFL on, on Ukraine is very clear. See, and I will say one thing on this point. I know <laughs> that this is not just Jan saying this because I know people who from day one when the first rockets fell, people went for more than 20 hours uh, drive with buses and where did they go to people from the network that they may not necessarily have met before mm -hmm. but they went to their houses and stayed for a day a week or a month or something like that. and i know people who have done that uh, both from the side of the um, refugee and both on the side from someone offering uh, their help i mean i i i'm far away from from um, from uh, the war i mean i'm, I'm from macedonia but my doors were opened uh, bec being uh, like an uh, alumni you know with sfl but the doors were open from the get-go for i don't know foreigners from ukraine joining yeah i wanted to say that as well that a lot of our former students who are now because our students are still students right they have limited resources as well uh so they mostly help with the time with the yep. space to accommodate people and and uh sending what they can send but many of our alumni and, and partners in Europe actually got even much more involved and they were actively in and out of Ukraine since they won. Uh, uh, one thing I want to mention is the Liberal Institute, uh, the Prague Think Tank where I also work, uh, has an ongoing project on that and I think we have shipped over $200,000 $200, worth of material since, start, since the war started. So I think that was one of the Life. Those are private donations. Sorry for interrupting. Yes. Okay. That was, uh, so that's the big, the good part with with NGOs. Uh, I, I'm I'm cutting you, but like in Macedonia, people think that NGOs is all about uh, uh, you know getting uh, money for free or something along those lines. You know, uh, funneling money, etc. But the thing is, in the in I would say mostly in America, but in the West, this this sort of thing works. People actually want yeah. to donate. You might not agree with with whatever the donations are for in this case with help for Ukraine, but the thing is this happens, you know, people do donate on this. 
See, what I did now is put some of the sort of water that comes from the beans inside and we are sort of gonna let it simmer and after that we just mix everything and finish, you know, simmering and all of a sudden it's gonna be, become creamier and creamier and that's, this is sort of, should be 5 to 10 minutes depending on how uh, hot is it. Anyhow, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm for it. yeah, coming back to the more important, more important things, uh, no, so... Nothing, nothing. More we are, uh, I don't know, maybe drinks? I mean, you're from Venezuela, you don't know the Balkan way, you know. Oh, we drink whiskey all the time. Uh, scotch, in this case. This case, scotch. Uh, by the way, we are drinking in a very uh, espresso cup, uh, you know. This was by choice, not because we did not have, you know, proper cups. Right. It's by choice. That's what I'm going to tell everybody. Cheers, guys. Cook and Liberty. Yes. Cook and Liberty. Mm. And since we are on the, on the, on the... Yeah. No, no, it was not a question of alcohol, but I'm gonna make a question of alcohol. Nice. Would you say that the German beer or the Poly uh, or the Czech beer, which one is better? Of course, the Czech, Czech beer. Oh. Hey, we also have like a large lead on the on the Germans. No, uh, I, I know you drink more. I'm just saying, yes. what, what's tastier? So you know that I think that answers your question. Like, <laughs> that's why we drink it. Maybe it's just cheaper. I don't know. Maybe you produce more. I don't know. I don't, I'm just, you know, asking the cheeky questions. Yeah, oh, yeah. by the way, I forgot to add some salt in it. Yay. <laughs> what do you drink in Venezuela? Uh, we drink uh, rum. A lot of rum. That's what people like it. Uh, me personally, I like a scotch. So that has been my drink uh, since forever. We drink rum. We drink beer. A ton of Cuba Libres. Mm. That's what we drink in Venezuela. Rum was the unofficial, uh, unofficial payment method to win COVID in the Czech Republic. Oh, what? That was the, the, yeah, that was like when you needed somebody to, to do something for you, you just gave them a bottle of rum or a few. Yeah, See, I, I never I heard that. I think we still do that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's like the go-to bribe method. Well, in Macedonia, it's not the go-to bribe method, but it works in a different setting as in you go to the doctors and after having your yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, surgery done uh, properly, then you sort of... It's not drunk, Pardon. it's extra motivation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, comes, this comes afterwards, this is a thankfulness. You know? yeah, yeah, it's yeah. A, it's a ten no, in Macedonia it's not incentive, and not a bribe, it's like thankfulness afterwards okay. because you don't expect good stuff from the doctors in principle, so when the, it happens, you, you, gotta, you gotta pay your, you know, uh, your, right, pay you your respect with a bottle of whatever. Yeah. Usually it's whiskey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I, I did not expect that the episode would go this way, but you know, <laughs> fun friends, fun stuff, different cultures. Why not, man? I, I think at, at the end, uh, look, why, why we want freedom for people? Like, we want people to enjoy their lives. Like, we want to, if you ask a young person, whether in Macedonia or in Venezuela, what do they want? They want to have fun, go to the movies, go have a drink, have the money to build a family. Uh, and all these things. Um, that's what freedom is for. Uh, the institutions, all that is just a means to an end. Mm -hmm. So why not to talk about those things? Uh, definitely, to, to definitely, 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 definitely. <laughs> and but getting back to the more serious questions, right. let, let, let's talk about favorite favorite thinkers, alive, dead, mm. to come. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Maybe, right. maybe. Okay. Uh, I don't know. What What would be your favorite, let's say, uh, thinker, uh, Jorge? Okay. So. And please give us thing. give us some American. Uh, I mean, not American, but English name, so we can actually uh, nod with our heads. Yes, no, no, we know that guy. It's not Venezuelan guy. <laughs> I mean, thinkers in general. Look, for example, when it comes to philosophy, I'm really into John Rawls. I think, and I have debated a lot about this issue. I think there is a very, there's a way, a way to see John Rawls from a classical liberal perspective. So uh, of the ghost and Tomasi. Sorry? Uh, Tomasi, the, the, yeah. the director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so. He takes it that direction. Exactly, so, and I believe similarly. Um, and I remember, for example, I was reading uh, Marcus Aurelius a few months ago, and you texted me about it. Yes, so yes, 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 I know, I know. Uh, I read the Stoics a lot. So I'm very into Marcus Aurelius in the sense of controlling what you can control, uh, behave in according to virtue, and I really like that. See, I gotta ask now with, because you mentioned Aurelius. Uh, <laughs> Would you, would you find his meditations interesting read or would you say an abridged version that you can find on YouTube for no. 10 minutes? See, that's my case, for example, with, with Aurelius. That's why I hated your message. Like, you messaged <laughs> me something like, I posted the picture of me here in Lisbon, in fact. I was mm. in Lisbon in October 
and I post a picture of Marcos Aurelius book and I was in Carcavelos at the beach, right? And he's like, ha ha ha, good thinker, bad book. <laughs> so, and, I, and he said, no man, no. And he asked me that question. And I think Marcos Aurelius, when you read him and you actually pay attention to what he says and you actually try to put yourself into his shoes, you know, it's an extremely interesting book. And I think you cannot watch a video or you cannot watch uh, or read a summary. You actually need to read the book. I really enjoy it. I know that it's not for everybody because it's, a sm it's like short sentences like that doesn't have any co coherence. See, it's not technically a book as it's in, not a book. it's, it's not diary. even a lecture. It's a journal. Yeah, journal diary, but like fascinating stuff nonetheless, but still. Fascinating. I, I think that I would have loved to hear, uh, I, don't, I would have rather spent 10, 10 hours um, uh, with uh, having lectures from, I don't know, a professional, right. a professor, instead of me reading for 10 hours that same book. Because I think that it's one of the rare cases that I think his message is far better than his book. <laughs> but that's the thing, is that when you read the book, it's not about actually reading it, it's about actually analyzing it, like meditating on meditations. That's why you have to do it. And That's why he's a Kelly girl, you know, bringing meditations on, on, on the beach. I know, I know. Exactly. So, um, and about the Stoics, uh, there are other two Stoics that I think are amazing. Epictetus yep. is one of them, the one who was a slave until he was 30 years old, and then he became a professor. And um, there is Seneca as well, I think it's, of it's, course. it's great. So yeah, and, and economists, there are many economists that I really enjoy. There is the Latin American economist, Hernando de Soto, that I think is brilliant. Yeah. Um, and yes, but I don't, I don't want to bother you too much and to bother I mean, I, I enjoy this. Uh, you do not bother me. You might uh, bother our audience because uh, they are not like, ah, Hernando de Soto, I, I don't know him, but he's a great guy, by the way. And I, I have heard this from a high level professor. Uh, I was sort of asking, in a sense, in a bit depressed way about, you know, liberalism and Hernando de Soto in question. And she's like, you know, older professor, she was like, Simon, like, back in my days when I was your age, um, no one sort of knew the Soto, and it's not that his ideas were any worse back then or any similar thing, he just did not come to prominence. Nowadays, uh, his ideas are taken very seriously by the establishment, you know, establishment economists, and I was like, okay, not a professional economist, you know, but like, I will trust your word for it, but... No, but that's the thing, is that Hernando Soto doesn't have a PhD in economics, uh, for instance, and his message, what is interesting to me is how appealing it is and how fact-based it is. Yep. And it shows a narrative and I think it shows like a real story of, of, of Latin America. Uh, so yes. From the American economist, I think Ronald Coase is brilliant. But let's not go there. He is a Nobel laureate who has written the least amount of... Eight papers, I think. Uh, something like that. Yeah. Uh, but at the same time, one of the most quoted, I think he's definitely on the top 100 quoted of all time. I mean, so, his, his two papers, The Theory of the yeah. and, and, and Social so, Cost, yes. is uh, unbelievable. Like, it's, it's just astonishing to me. I, I would agree with you, but yes. again, our, our, our technically not liter listeners, watchers. Watchers, yeah, they, they're, I, I yeah, don't think that they're. Your followers. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, felt like I'm in a cult, you know, my followers. Right. <laughs> what about uh, books with, with coming from Jan Marshovsky? Okay. Uh, All of a sudden, he's going to go Václav Havel for sure. Uh, it, would be, it would be a long list. I would say that I, speaking of the Nobel laureates, I would say definitely... No need for Nobel laureates, just... I no would need. definitely say I'm a big fan of Hayek, economically. Not that much, uh, uh, not that much on some other stuff. Uh, and I'm a fan of the tradition, so I, I like Lavoy as well, I yeah. like Steve Horowitz. Uh, and I very much enjoy, you mentioned roles, I very much enjoy Nozick. And I very much enjoy the, the sort of the Kantian straight to libertarianism. So, so I enjoy that as well. Kant is really interesting as well to debate. Because yes. again, like, exactly, we can agree on Hayek, but I brought up roles and you brought up Kant. Yeah. Which I think are very. I like to talk about roles. I don't like roles, but I like to talk about them. I like to because again, like, <laughs> in Gnostic we will agree on eighty percent of things, but we can't, for example, the amount of debate that there is in classical liberals because of how Puritan Kant can be. Mm. Yeah, uh, that's and, true. And and his whole theory of the arc of history and the metaphysics of Kant is just extremely interesting to debate it is. and this is what I like sometimes I, I, I don't like echo chambers at all yeah I like to yeah. try to bring difficult thinkers and try to see the good the bad the not so good 
Uh, I have even tried to debate with libertarians about Henry Kissinger, mm. <laughs> for instance. So yeah. it's an easy thing. Like him or not, he is sort of one of the most important people after the war. Yeah. Again, like him or not. Worst case scenario, you have to just study him. Worst case scenario. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I have not. I'm an economist only. <laughs> but yeah. Uh, You're doing your PhD, right? Yes. Yeah. Nice. And, and yeah, how, many, how many years are you, do you... You're doing your dissertation already? Uh, we don't really have the American stuff. We don't have courses. We're supposed to write from the beginning. Uh, so, are you supposed to be writing? I'm not really. Uh, <laughs> so, so you're really a PhD student. No, I, I, I enjoy the teaching component of it. Okay. I don't think... I enjoy reading stuff and I enjoy teaching stuff. I don't think I am a good researcher. Okay, uh, I, I I just don't think that the way you need to go to get ahead in academic economics is something that's fun for me. And I th mm -hmm. don't think many of the things you need to do is any real contribution to anything. Okay, interesting. I, I, I look, I, I, I can... Uh, you just need to impress that. people by how complicated yeah. a statistical method you are applying to how niche data and that's not really something that I bring, think uh, brings much value. A lot of academia is that. It's your showing how your methods are more elegant yes. than others. And there is not much debate going on on many fields, especially in, yeah, in the humanities, in social sciences. See, I was going to say, we are talking about more economics, academics uh, now, but like, I, I know for a fact that from all the papers written, on average, they have around two to three views, which means that when you think how, how uh, sorry, not, not reads, uh, reads, but uh, how many Numbers. sightings? No, oh, sightings. Okay. So when you see that, it's like basically people are pumping, pumping out papers just because it's part of the job description. Yes. Not necessarily as you say that they were A, good, or B, they have found something, but you know, that's like sort of academia. No, no they're not influential. Like I, you mentioned that. For example, I published this paper at Economic Affairs last year, which takes, a lot of, of hours to actually produce like a good paper and good research and to publish takes time. And then how many people read it? A small few people. Mm. But then if I publish an article at a newspaper, many more people will read it, many more quotes, more influential, because journalists, for example, will actually read those mm. and people. See, I did ask you about your favorite sort of thinkers uh, and no one asked me, but I <laughs> will sort of say that, please, please. for example, I like Friedman, even though I'm, I would call myself an Austrian economist, right. I like Friedman far more than anyone because I think that he really did change the world. He was influential. Yeah, yes. yeah, he really managed to help change the world in a better more than anyone and this is a uh, when you ask an acad academic they will sort of disagree with me because oh he was not academic enough even though he was uh friedman had, had it all more or less he was a great communicator yes. and he i all, yeah. I, I think that uh I, I, there was 10 years ago or something like that uh, why don't we see a new milton friedman today the best answer i i got from that uh, sort of conference was we have and it's called paul krugman and yes and what about from the other we, side? we just don't we just don't necessarily agree with him, but like we have that communicator. I mean, nowhere near as Friedman, I would say, but still. Uh, uh, so for you guys, but we, uh, don't, we don't have a classical liberals. That's that, the, that's the thing. I mean, he is very liberal on trade. Like on trade, he is like who? No, no. Oh, well, and he won, he won the Nobel. No, 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 no. I, I will say this thing. <laughs> he was in his books and everything when he was the economist but after he became the pundit he mm. he he i mean you can easily quote from his book and i have seen uh from our circles people cl uh, quote and they will be like do do uh, who do you think uh, said that was it friedman was it hayek no it was it was krugman that yeah. this was krugman the economist not krugman the pundit but with this, we sort of end this uh, first part of the episode. Well, this is uh, simmering, which is basically going to be done in like two or three minutes. Uh, you are going to see sort of the plating part. And uh, we are going to come in the second part of the episode with the uh, ba bananas, the, the easy way of doing bananas when you sort of have to lie to your children that you sort of made a, a new way of sweets. Well, the time has come for us to sort of do the sweet thing now, which is going to be bananas um, that will be soaked in a lot of honey and bit too, uh, a bit too much butter, depends on how, how much you want. And it's quite tasty. And then after 
after basically that you just pour the extra sauce on top and on, on the sauce you can just put some extra walnuts and some bis bis biscuits you just crush them the way you want as as little as you want nice. just on top and that's it so that's what i'm doing and because we sort of talked about favorite thinkers mm -hmm. and most of the thinkers you know are dead usually so what would be the books and let's not talk about special books but that were written in 1930s or 50s let's talk about something new so what would be your choice of books new uh, books yes I, I mean for example okay i can tell you the books that i have uh, bought in the last month so or so um, I this is him bragging by the way I, uh, yeah <laughs> yes. i okay so i for example i bought uh, the new book of henry kissinger which we mentioned uh, a, few, uh, a few minutes before he has 99 years old and he's keep writing so he wrote a book on leadership and he wrote it's like a series of biographies uh, about Charles de Gaulle, about Adenauer, about Margaret Thatcher, about uh, Nixon. Did he like uh, Margaret Thatcher? Yeah, he did, in fact, yes. What so, about de Gaulle? Uh, he, you know, de Gaulle is a very polemic figure, uh, and it's especially for people that see it from the American uh, perspective. So, yeah, it's, uh, he really likes Adenauer, and that's what I noticed. And I bought last week the book of Adolfo Suarez, who may have, you guys may not know about him, but is this the politician from Spain, the Spanish politician, who was responsible to the transition from the dictatorship of Franco uh, to democracy. And he was able to make alliances with both the Franquistas, the extreme right-wingers, but with the communists and with the socialists as well. Uh, so I think it's a really um, interesting book, taking into consideration uh, those factors. What about you, Jan? Uh, so speaking of recent books, because I like it, uh, I just finished uh, uh, Below Zero by uh, George Selgin, who we have here at mm -hmm. LibertyCon, and I bought and still have an open on my on my desk the new book Better Money by uh, Larry White. Mm. And oh, uh, I didn't know that it came out. Nice. Yeah, See, a and, cool reminder. And. Uh, what else? And I bought, I found a wonderful, uh, like the first edition of Philosophical Explanations by oh, Nozick. Right. So it's a book like from back in you know, the eighties or something. And and I I found the first edition for like eight dollars somewhere. So I have that on my table. But what I was what I'm reading now is uh, Why We Drive by Matthew Crawford. Okay. And I'm reading it because it was the last book that I've seen reviewed by, by Steve Horvitz before he died mm. and I, I, mean, I always liked his, like, both his books and his reading tips and this was the first one where I was uneasy reading it. I, I never had the... No. I had a feeling that like, I might be too young for this book. Uh, it was very nostalgic and I wasn't feeling it when I was reading really? it. I was thinking maybe this is like you know, him in his situation recommending the book. But recently I, uh, I, I, I drove after a long time. And uh, I, I sort of, you know, I, I, I really enjoyed it. I, I like driving and I haven't driven for a while and then I was driving again. And you get like the, you get the, the feeling of driving is great. I think it's very libertarian thing. Uh, I think it's, it's the, Feeling of control that you have. It is. It's also, I think, car is also like the ultimate hike in, like, <laughs> argument in flesh because you don't understand how. At least I don't understand how, how any of that works, but it somehow gets you places. Exactly. Uh, without you needing to know that. See, uh, you said very libertarian. Someone might say very, uh, very American, and maybe. someone might say it's both at and the same also, time. And it's also like you know, car. You know, I, I think like, in a way, it's different from planes and stuff. Because oh, there you buy the no, you buy the ticket there, right? So there is you you pass some check. You you have the feeling of getting permission. When you buy a ticket, you have the feeling of getting permission. Mm -hmm. But the car you can just take and drive. Yes. That's sure that's the component that you have, and it can take you places very fun. So now coming back to the book, uh, after driving for a break, I I started like I started feeling the book more. So mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to finishing. Interesting. Well, we have. Come to the last part of the show where uh, the our our sweet sort of post dinner treat is getting sort of cooked and finished. Um, 
but uh, before we go there I have to ask you know the best question which is my favorite and that's why it's best so ha I'm gonna sneeze <laughs> uh, but the question is how to find freedom in a non-free world and I'll, I'll give the floor to Jan first what would be your answer Jan how to find freedom in a non-free world that's a good question it's a good question and I think it's very easy to answer it here when we are in the free world uh, because as much as we can complain about about anything that we don't like about the current system of government here, uh, we pretty much have it all. So I do think that one way is to just outpace uh, outpace the, the the regulations and the unfree part of the world because that's what keeps happening. I think I'm optimist. I'm not optimistic about system changing much, I'm optimistic about us uh, being faster in them. So uh, one example could be Bitcoin and things that allow people to be more financially free and secure and other things in the, in the, and, and, pri and, and private and so on. But I think that this is generally the direction to be going. And speaking of personally, I think, uh, as Jorge said, I think before, or maybe you said it before, uh, what's important is finding the things that matter personally and not 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 focus only on, on politics and the things that we can't really change uh, as individuals immediately and and, and find the joy in, in, in what you can do. However, the choices If you are did not good. understand the first part of, of Jan's sensor, if you have extra Bitcoin and you don't know what to do with them, Find find down below the, the description <laughs> tab and donate some. Five, ten, five hundred. We don't mind. We'll keep them. No it, will, it will significantly help Simon yes. finding his freedom. Yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Definitely. Small change to the world, guys. Small change. One one cup of co Bitcoin coffee at a time. Exactly. <laughs> what about you, Jorge? Uh, look, uh, the first thing that we must say is that uh, the vast majority of people in the world lived in on free systems. Uh, the people who live in Western Europe, in the U.S., are a, minor, a minority. With that being said, everybody can find their freedom because it doesn't matter where you live, doesn't matter the situation that you are in, doesn't matter the abuse that you are receiving or the repression that you are receiving, you always have choice. Like, your mind is yours, nobody else. So, the way that you devote your life, the, the, the pursuits that you do, the way that you give meaning to your life, those are things that only you control. Nobody else can control. You can be born in a country like Venezuela, you can be born in a country like Cuba, and still have the free will to choose your future, and to choose the way you think, the way every day you devote your life. So if your question is, how can you find freedom in an unfree world? It's, I think, to, through the pursuit of what you think is a virtuous life, what you think is a meaningful life. And I think if we don't forget that, I think we can be free. Because you know what is not being free? is to be exposed and dependent on external situations. And not only politics. There are people that get into uh, abusive job positions, professional positions, toxic relationships, and... These are ways to slave yourself uh, upon the situation. So what we have to do is to always live in a meaningful way and to never forget that decisions, we are the only ones who make decisions. Uh, we are never imposed a decision. This will not lo look very tasty, but it will be very tasty. I, I promise you that. Sure. But uh, more or less with this sort of end and our episode here in Lisbon, uh, days before Liberty Con, so... Next year, do join LibertyCon because by the time this goes online, LibertyCon will be behind us, but definitely next year, do uh, visit um, uh, LibertyCon, check out Ask Students for Liberty because they are very close to my heart on a personal level, not just because I have a representative of SFL today with me and another one with alumni. So, yes, with that, I will leave you and have a better life than you had yesterday. And, yeah, until next time, take care, guys. Thank you.